Hi everybody, Lee Veras here, bringing you Photoshop tips and techniques for teachers and students. Uh, and uh, I have a good one for you today. Uh, it's all about uh, my, our favorite nightmare subject, color management. Uh, a friend of mine uh, emailed me with uh, some questions um, that came up while he was watching some online tutorials uh, about uh, color management. And we have two Photoshop gurus who are presenting material um, that uh, there's some questions about it. And it, it just brought up to mind that uh, after 20 or more years of color management, we still don't get it. So I thought I would, uh, I thought I'd examine this stuff for you right now, how to use it or how to avoid problems with it. And uh, I just want to bring this up. Um, most of your, your color management issues come from your color settings in Photoshop. So I'm going to open up the color settings dialog here. And uh, on, on two separate um, videos on YouTube, um, these gurus were showing the color settings here and talking about how Photoshop handles uh, mismatches between what your workspace um, RGB setting is and any embedded uh, profiles that come in from uh, images that you open up. And they, they kept this dialogue on screen for several minutes, talking about how unexpected things can happen if you don't have the right profile embedded and you open it up and, and, and Photoshop will get confused. And uh, they left this dialogue up on the screen for several minutes. And all of the problems they were talking about could be addressed if we actually changed the color settings and clearly they were using the, the default this is uh this is how photoshop ships with north american general purpose uh settings up here you can see uh that i've got this head this up here and in fact the easiest thing to do to mitigate any of these problems is to go from uh, the north american general purpose to north american pre-press 2. so if i select that You'll notice that uh, the RGB color space changes to Adobe RGB. And more importantly, these checkboxes here get checked. Ask when opening, ask when pasting, and ask when opening. Uh, dealing with profile mismatches and missing profiles. And this uh, was failed uh, to be mentioned by these two Photoshop gurus. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into this now. I'm going to leave the settings here the way they did at the North American general purpose, which is the first thing I would do is change from those uh, preset settings. And uh, we're going to look at one of the issues uh, that they were talking about. So I'm going to open up an image here. And here's, here's a nice image that I took on our uh, last safari to Tanzania here, this lion picture. Everything looks good. Uh, you can see now that I've, I've got uh, my workspace showing here in the lower left corner. I've got document profile showing. So you can always see that this in this particular image, it's got sRGB as the embedded profile. I also am displaying in the info panel over here sRGB uh, so I know what color space the image is. All right, so I'm going to open up another image here. And this one is uh, the same lion, but this time uh, using Profoto. And so here's the lion in Profoto RGB. Here's the lion in sRGB. And you'll notice that there's absolutely no difference, but uh, it's in a different color space. It looks the same, but it's in a different color space. So the issue here. And the way it was demonstrated in uh, at least one of the videos that we're talking about, when you open up uh, a file that has, um, it's in a different workspace than your default that you've chosen in the color settings, you can get some color mismatches. So I'm going to open up uh, the Lion in Pro Photo, but this time without the profile embedded. So you can see down here it says untagged RGB over here, untagged RGB. So it looks different. Why does it look different? Well, it looks different because it's actually in a color space that doesn't match my default color space. 
And Photoshop gave me no warning when I opened it, and it looks weird. So, uh, you know, how, how do we really address that? So I'm going to close this again. And the reason, the way you address it, it's very simple. And this was not pointed out in these uh, two different um, tutorials about color management is we make sure that we check these boxes. So these are our color management policies. We always want to preserve the embedded profiles, as we can see here for RGB, CMYK, and gray. Preserve embedded profiles, but also, very important, you want to have these checked. The easiest way to do that is to select, again, as I showed before, instead of North American General Purpose, we're going to select North American Prepress 2, which is kind of the professional printing industry standard way of dealing with this. Uh, I would prefer that Photoshop set this preset up as a default. So if you've never changed your color settings, at least it would start off with these checkboxes checked. All right, so now that we have those checked, I'm going to go ahead and switch this back to sRGB, which is my preferred color space. And now we're going to open up that same... Um, Profile image that does not have the profile embedded. So here's that lion picture again. I'm going to try to open it up. And instead of it opening up right away, I get this missing profile warning. And it's, it's, it's telling me that this image that I'm opening up does not have an embedded RGB profile. What would you like to do? And your choices are leave as is, don't color manage. If we choose that and we open it up, it's going to show us what this file looks like in sRGB, and so the colors change. That's what it looks like, the actual sRGB file. This is a profile, pro photo uh, profiled image being displayed in sRGB, and you can see that the color changes pretty dramatically. It gets very dull. Okay. So uh, when, you open, when you leave as is and you don't color manage, you can see now it says untagged RGB, you're still looking at it in your preferred color space as defined in your color settings. So remember, we had set that to sRGB. This file is opening up. I chose to leave it as is, and therefore it doesn't look right. Okay. Uh, the other choice, let's let's open it up again here. We're going to open that same uh, Profoto Lion here. And we can assign our current working space, which is, as it shows here, sRGB. Or we can play a kind of what-if game. So um, if I open it up in sRGB, it's not going to look right. We already saw that. So I'm going to instead assign a profile and you can choose different profiles if you're if you're curious or you, you have what we used to call mystery meat color uh, well we don't know what it is we can pick uh, from among the profile you know they can pick any profile that's in your system here uh, to look at it but I know that it's in pro photo so I'm gonna choose to assign the pro photo RGB right and then we're gonna open it up and now it looks correct. Uh, let me place a few uh, color samplers in the image here. I'm going to put it right on the end of his nose. And we'll do the same thing in the, in the sRGB file, right in the end of the nose. And you can see over here, in sRGB, these numbers are 176, 131, and 90. In Profoto, it's 121, 102, and 62. So the, the actual numbers in the file have changed even though the color appearance is pretty much the same, right? Uh, and that's because Profoto RGB is a much larger color space, so it doesn't need uh, the, the same numbers. It need, needs lower numbers to create the same level of color, right? So in sRGB, it's got these set of numbers. Profoto, it has these set of numbers. OK, so by having that warning there, when you open a file that doesn't have an embedded profile, you're given a heads up. Hey, this file doesn't have a profile. Uh, maybe we have to think about um, what we're going to do to view it properly. Um, so 
again, uh, looking at your color settings, what we want to do is always have these profile mismatch checkboxes checked. Ask when opening, ask when pacing, ask when opening. And that way we're always going to get a warning in case uh, we don't have uh, a proper uh, profile embedded in the image. Now, this is sort of an unlikely scenario where you're going to get a Profoto file that doesn't have a profile embedded. Uh, a more likely scenario is, let's say you're working, your, your chosen default workspace is Profoto RGB. And uh, let's say we don't have these warnings checked. And you're going to now open uh, an sRGB file that doesn't have a profile embedded. So uh, if I open an sRGB file, like say I downloaded this from the internet from a stock photo uh, website, uh, and I, it doesn't have a profile embedded to save space uh, to make the file smaller. So I'm going to download it, and I, if I don't have those warning mismatches checked, I'm going to open up the file and it will open up and assume that that file is in Profoto RGB. And in fact, it's, this one is not. And you can see in this case, the color got way more vivid. This is the appropriate color. This is the way more vivid color. And uh, you can kind of see if you see something like this where it just looks garish and you, you, you think well, that's kind of weird. What you can do is go under your edit here and uh, assign, not convert, but we're going to assign a different profile and see how it's going to change this file. Now, before I do that, let me just put my, uh, uh, let me put my uh, sampler there. So you can see the numbers now read 192, 146, 104. The color looks like this. Let's go ahead and assign a different profile so we're going to assign, in this case, we're going to assign our work, not our working space profile, but a different profile. We're going to assign sRGB. And lo and behold, now it looks uh, like the color is proper color. But you'll notice that the, color, the numbers here did not change. If I undo that, and now it's, now it's in its sort of untagged state, but being displayed in Profoto RGB. You notice the numbers didn't change here at all, right? As soon as I go back and reassign the sRGB profile, look over here in the numbers. The numbers don't change, but the color appearance changes. So it's very important that we always embed profiles um, and that we always use our color management policies set up appropriately. So again, review, going back here, um, going to the color settings. We want to make sure that we have ask when opening checked, ask when pasting checked, and for missing profiles, ask when opening. Always make sure that's checked. Um, now for me, I don't like using Profoto RGB. I'm going to set it back to sRGB. Let's review this color management stuff. Let's look at a little history. Um, so now we've had color management for quite some time. It was actually a, an Apple invention. Uh, in 1993, Apple uh, introduced ColorSync. And this was going to become the color management framework for everything that happened after it. Uh, 1994, the International Color Consortium. Uh, you may uh, be familiar with the ICC uh, initials. Uh, that stands for International Color Consortium. And they made the uh, ColorSync 2.0 the international standard for color management. 1996, Hewitt Packard and Microsoft created sRGB as the universal color space and this was adopted by just about everyone. Uh, and it's the color space that we see ubiquitous on the internet, uh, copiers, printers, uh, all kinds of things uh, have settled on the standard RGB. The S does not stand for satanic or shitty. Uh, it just stands for standard. So standard RGB 
Um, and pretty much everybody supports that uh, uh, right out of the box um, for cameras, uh, copiers, scanners, everything can kind of support sRGB. Now, 1998, Photoshop actually, that's the first time Photoshop became fully color managed and supported the ICC standard. So all this stuff uh, that we see in the color settings, we were just talking about it, that first appeared in 1998, over 20 years ago. Okay, 2007, GIMP, which is the Linux uh, 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 kind of version of Photoshop, finally supports uh, the ICC color management uh, standard. And, uh, you know, now 2020, uh, people still don't understand color management. <laughs> so, uh, as we could see when we were looking at um, uh, in Photoshop, um, there's still issues where people don't understand why, you know, the color might not match. Uh, and, and in fact, you have to kind of go out of your way uh, to save an image out of Photoshop without a profile. So if, I, if I'm going to go and save as here, in order to save it without a profile, I have to go out of my way and uncheck this embed profile. Now, the only time you might want to do that if you is if you're trying to save space and your your uh, you're trying to make your file size smaller for display on the internet. That that profile takes up a little bit more data in the file, and if we don't embed it, the file will be just a little bit smaller. And so um, it's become kind of a common practice for images that are destined for the internet to just strip the profile out of it so that it makes the file size smaller. But you'll, it, by default, as soon as you come into this dialog, if I, if I you know, save as here, by default, this is going to be checked. Every time I open this dialog, you'll see this is checked. I have to actually uncheck it in order to save it without the profile. So um, under normal use, you should never really have a problem with this. And certainly if you're uh, working with your own images, uh, you're not going to have any issues. Uh, I still recommend setting up your color settings, though, so that you have these checkboxes checked. Um, now, very interesting. Um, these working spaces here in the color settings, these are your preferred or default working spaces. Okay, so my preferred working space here I've set is sRGB. Uh, my CMYK, US Web Coded or, or Swap V2, this is an old uh, standard um, that is pretty universal. Anywhere you go to a print shop, if uh, you give them a Photoshop file, they will assume that it's, if it's in CMYK, it's this particular profile. Uh, in fact, you have a whole bunch of different choices here, um, but uh, we might as well stick with kind of the standard that everybody assumes anyway. In case they do something silly, um, they're more likely to uh, honor or expect this profile, so I'm just going to leave that set there. Uh, very interesting here, the gray, uh, these gray and the spot color profiles. Uh, by default, it says dot gain 20%. Um, if you were doing, uh, if you were converting files into grayscale for a newspaper, you might want to use 25 or 30%, depending on what the newspaper specs are. Pretty typically, newspapers are not very good printing conditions, and so they expect a lot of dot gain. So when we select a higher dot gain, we're going to get a slightly lighter uh, version of the grayscale file. So the 20% is kind of right in the middle. There's been a lot of discussion about how we should change our gray gamma, the, the gray profile, to a gray gamma of 1.8 if you're using Profoto or 2.2 if you're using Adobe RGB or sRGB. Um, now, in practice, uh, let me explain what these working spaces preferences are used for here. So I'm just going to go ahead and say okay here. The only time those come into play is when I do a, a just a straight ahead mode change. If I go Photoshop, I get image mode, and I convert into some other workspace. Like if I just convert to 
CMYK color here. The profile it's going to choose, and you get this little warning unless you check don't show again, that you're going to convert into swap v2 because that is my preferred profile for CMYK. And uh, they warn you, they say this may not be what you intend to choose a different profile, use edit convert to profile. So typically I always tell people when you're going to convert, make sure you know what profile you're converting to. So you would go edit convert to profile. And here's where you get to choose, you know, if I'm going from uh, RGB to some other RGB, I can choose that here, or I can choose uh, my CMYK, my default profiles will see right up here. They appear at the top of this dialogue, uh, but I could pick something else. I could pick, you know, the sheet fed coded. Um, I could pick Japan color coded. I, you know, there's all kinds of different profiles that I could pick, but the only time, um, and here we see a, a preview of what the, the, the gray, um, profile would look like. The only time these, um, uh, your, your defaults that you set up in the color setting come into play is during a mode change when you do image mode and you pick uh, one of these uh, color spaces here. So we can, we can go into grayscale. If I select grayscale, what it's going to use is, you know, here again, they give that warning. Are you sure you want to throw away the color information? You probably should use image adjustments black and white. So I have, to, I have to actually go out of my way here and say, yes, discard. I want it to convert it into a single channel grayscale, right? So here's my single channel grayscale. All right, let's, let's now back up. Because there is one case where, uh, if we look at our color settings again, there's one case where this grayscale uh, preference here for a working space uh, can be important. And um, it's, it's actually still a mode change <laughs> where it comes in, uh, but it's a little unexpected. And so um, uh, another Photoshop guru was talking about this as it relates to luminosity masking, which is also all the rage right now. And his suggestion was, you know, if, if you are using the Profoto uh, workflow and you've got Profoto RGB, what you want to do is change your gray gamma to 1.8. Okay, so, uh, and if you're going to be using sRGB, uh, you should probably use a, a gray gamma of 2.2. Now, there's only one instance where this uh, comes into place. Um, I'm going to leave this set here for the time being. And the only time that that's important when it's not really a mode change is when we're loading a selection. If we wanted to create a luminosity mask, for instance, and uh, uh, I will illustrate this, um, we will um, we'll put a, uh, a solid color layer here. I'm going to make it black. Bear with me here. I'm just setting things up. And um, let's now, uh, I'm going to load another, uh, well, let's load a selection, right? So uh, you can go to your channels panel, and uh, if you hold down the command or control key, you'll notice that the little cursor changes there. You can see that little dotted line show up, uh, like a dotted rectangular marquee. That is how I would load the luminosity of the RGB channel as a selection. So if I click on that, it loads uh, the luminosity values as a selection. And now if I, uh, I'm going to turn on that black layer and we're going to make a solid color white layer. And you can kind of see that the it put the selection into the layer mask. So it's giving me uh, sort of a grayscale rendition based on the luminosity values that I got from the RGB, the composite RGB channel. Okay, so um, let's let's go back to that. I'm gonna actually what I'm gonna do is make a a, a layer comp here, and uh, we're gonna load this as this was our um, uh, we are an sRGB. Gray gamma 
uh, 2.2. Okay. So that uh, was the selection that we loaded was based on the gray gamma of 2.2. All right. Now, if I change my color settings and I change away from the gray gamma, let's do something uh, really ridiculous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a got dot gain of 30% here. So this should give me a much lighter gray version of uh, that RGB file if I do a mode change, image mode up there. Um, and let's, let's check this out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back here. I'm going to command or control click on that RGB again to load. This time, uh, this is going to be a gray gamma of uh, the dot gain of 30%. So I'm going to do the same thing, pick the solid white, and that's going to be sRGB, gray gamma of, or it's actually dot gain, 30. All right? So if we switch uh, back and forth here, if I go back to the 2.2 gamma, you can see that there's a slight difference appeared. Very slight but difference between 2.2 and a dot gain of 30. Okay, let's try, let's really use something completely different here. I'm going to go back to my color settings. And I'm going to select, instead of a dot gain of 30, we'll do a dot gain of 10%. Now, this should give me a much darker looking grayscale image. Do that same thing. We'll load the selection here from the RGB. OK, and uh, again, uh, turn on my black layer, and we'll go to our solid white color. It puts the selection in the layer mask. Now, this one. SRGB again, um, but this is dot 10. Right, so there's there's a, a dot gain of 10%, there's 30%, there's sRGB. So, you know, there's quite a difference here, right, in how the gray, uh, the grayscale from the selection loaded from the composite RGB is, right? And and uh, one of the, these Photoshop gurus that I was talking about has a whole uh, a lot of tutorials about uh, luminosity masking, and, and he's uh, very adamant that you should be always changing uh, your color settings uh, to more closely match the uh, grayscale gamma of your... Uh, chosen color space. So in this case, as a sRGB, I would choose 2.2 uh, to get uh, a more appropriate um, luminosity mask, in this case just being applied to uh, the layer mask of this solid color, this white uh, layer. Um, and so the idea is that this should match your RGB. In, in practice, I, I don't, first of all, I, I rarely load the uh, the luminosity values of the composite RGB channel, I'd much rather pick uh, one of the grayscale channels to use. Uh, for instance, if we look at the individual channels, here's uh, the red channel, there's the green channel, there's the blue channel. Uh, they all look different, and one of the, the, one of the things about um, loading luminosity uh, masks from the color image is, is taking advantage of the differences between the three channels. So if I wanted to, for instance, if I really wanted to isolate the, say, the lion's face here, I'm going to have a better, easier time using, uh, starting with the red channel, than I would uh, the composite RGB, which is really 60% um, of the green channel, 30% uh, of the red channel, and 10% of the blue channel. Um, but most of the luminosity, 60% of it, is in the green channel, right? So when I load that composite uh, luminosity, I'm going to get a luminosity mask that looks much more like the green channel than anything else, right? And this is interesting because the only time loading the lumin luminosity mask from a channel uh, 
the only time that depends on the gray gamma setting that you've chosen in your color settings is when you're loading from the composite channel. It has no impact when we load from one of the other channels, right? So, so here's the red channel of the RGB. Let me, let me just go back and um, let's, uh, so let, let me just check my color settings here. Uh, I've got the dot gain 10%. That's the most radically different looking one uh, loaded here. Uh, and I'm going to now load a selection from um, just the red channel. Instead of the composite RGB, I'm going to load it from the red channel. So I will then command or control, click on the red channel uh, thumbnail here, and I get a selection based on the red channel, right? Now, let's go back. I'll turn on my black layer. I'm going to add a solid color white layer. The selection is going to go into the layer mask, but it's going to show me now basically what uh, that grayscale luminosity looks like. Let's make another layer comp here. So this is um, sRGB from the red channel. Okay. So that's the red channel, and, and it doesn't matter if I change this now back, my color settings, if I change that back to, um, let's say, the, the dot gain 30, right? So that's far away from the, from the 10, uh, you know, the dot gain 10. And uh, again, we'll go back to the channel. I'll load the luminosity of the red channel. We go back to our um, solid color white layer, putting that into the layer mask. And there's my, uh, we'll, we'll do again, load the uh, layer comp here. This is uh, sRGB again, red channel, but with a dot of 10, right? This previous one here, let me just rename that. That was that was from dot thirty, right? So you'll notice that there's absolutely no difference. That's because we're loading the the luminosity directly from the channel. So it doesn't really matter what my color settings are because I'm not using a mode change to get to my grayscale luminosity. I'm just copying the values of the channel directly, right? Now, uh, it, it had never occurred to me that this was an issue because I just don't, I, I, I almost never load the, the composite RGB luminosity. I find it much more useful to, uh, you know, to, to load directly from the channels, okay? And typically, I don't even use this command click on the channels, although it's a, certainly a convenient way to get a selection. Uh, if I'm going to uh, load, um, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'll, I'll put a, a solid color layer up there, select that layer mask, and then use apply image. Uh, I'll use um, apply image to find not my merge layer, but I'll just go down to whatever layer I want to get the red channel from. And I'll load that directly from the red channel to the layer mask, right? So as you can see, uh, all of these are going to match. So this layer matches this layer and that layer. Uh, these are all loaded slightly differently, but they are all coming from that red channel luminosity. So that's the key here. The only reason you, you would be concerned about um, using, changing your color settings to match, um, to match your, the, the gamma of your workspace would be if you are going to load uh, the luminosity from the composite RGB which is typically, I, I think, less useful than actually going to the individual channels. Um, so, you know, uh, do you need to change your color settings? Uh, I would say don't lose sleep over it. If you, if you set this up at, at the default as dot gain 20, 
which is a fairly good match. I mean, it's pretty close to gray, gray, gray gamma 2.2, which is what the gamma of sRGB is. So if you're using sRGB, you can use either gray gamma 2.2 or just let it leave it at, at the default setting, which is dot gain 20%. You won't notice the difference, right? The only time you might want to change that gray setting is if you're using Profoto, uh, which I typically do not recommend using Profoto as a working space. If you are, then you what you're going to want to do is change the, the gray gamma to 1.8 because that gray gamma is what matches the gray gamma of Profoto RGB. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I, I, I would take a whole other rant to explain why Profoto RGB is really not a really good editing workspace for you to choose as a default. But if you are going to set up defaults, please go into your color settings, change them here, put the RGB workspace where you want it. Uh, I don't want to see you doing a tutorial where you bring up and you leave this at general purpose like this, okay, with these things unchecked. I don't want to see that. It's not the way you should be using your color settings. Um, kind of annoying uh, because, as I said, this is the default. If you never go into color settings, this is the way color, uh, Photoshop is set up. Uh, if we go to Lightroom, the preferences in Lightroom, if you never change the external editing preference, this is the way it's going to be set up for Photoshop file format, Pro Photo RGB, 16 bits, Okay, so every time you export something out of Lightroom or you go uh, to, you know, uh, edit in, for instance, photo edit in, and I open this up in Photoshop, it's going to open this file from the raw as a pro photo. So if that mismatches, if it, if it doesn't match what I've got set up in Photoshop, I may not be aware of it unless... I've actually gone into my settings and changed them, right? So uh, for me, I use sRGB, so uh, I'm gonna go back and set my uh, Lightroom preferences. Preferences. I'm gonna change this back to my preferred, uh, which is sRGB, I don't need 16 bits. If you can't make a good file with eight bits, you have bigger problems, uh, but uh, there we go. That's the way I set it up. So my Lightroom matches uh, the the export from Lightroom is going to come into Photoshop and it's going to match my preferred workspace. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, if we look at some of the other applications, uh, you know, one of my favorite ones here uh, is uh, <laughs> my I should say my favorite one to make fun of is uh, Luminar. Uh, so um, if I open up Luminar, we look at uh, the preferences of Luminar. Okay, preferences. There's 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 actually no place where you can set color color management policies. Um, I suspect that what Luminar is doing is it, it has its own internal color space, much like Lightroom uses a kind of linear pro photo, uh, which doesn't really relate to anything else in the world. Um, and you're exporting out of Luminar, much like you would do out of Lightroom. You're not actually editing in a particular workspace. Uh, the workspace comes in when you export. So, you know, Luminar gives you three choices, sRGB, Adobe RGB, or Profoto RGB, right? Uh, and that's it. You can't go into CMYK. You can't choose some custom uh, workspace. That's the only place where you get to choose a color space is when you export. Um, there's also no uh, info panel. I can't see what the numbers are in the file because basically the numbers don't mean anything when you're inside of Luminar. You're only going to get uh, useful numbers when you export it and actually ends up in some sort of color space. Uh, anyway, kind of an annoying thing about Luminar. Uh, let's look at uh, Affinity Photo. It actually has preferences here 
it has color preferences and you get you can choose any kind of profile you want to work in uh, you have CMYK profiles that you can choose um, and uh, it also has this checked by default you know warn when assigning working profile to unprofiled files okay so it's sort of a backwards way of doing it but at least you're going to get a warning so um, you know you can also check this um, you want to you, if you want to convert open files to working space automatically you can check that or you can have it warn you uh, so at the very least their preferences are set up pretty much right out of the box to be something reasonable uh, but again it's a professional uh, photo application where you are expected to go in and set up the preferences for the way you want to work. So um, definitely, um, I think color management has been around for 20 years. Um, different applications implement it in different ways, but it's worthwhile to know what you're getting into uh, when you use these um, color profiles. So. Let's uh, do a, a little review. Color management policies, these are important. It's important that you understand this and that you set up your preferences. So understand and edit your preferences and you do that through the color settings. Okay, check the color settings, check boxes, ask when opening, ask when pasting, and profile mismatches and missing profiles, you always wanna check those boxes and make sure that you're being asked if you find some mismatch or a missing profile. Um, probably a good idea. It's not the end of the world if you do. Don't do this, but change your grayscale preferences to match uh, the gray gamma of your chosen RGB color space. Okay. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's, it's better to just always use apply image instead of load selection because apply image allows you to pick a specific channel and you know exactly what you're getting into um, it's harder to click on the wrong thumbnail when you're loading a selection um, the other issue uh, that you know uh, happens when we uh, when we load selections if you if you're always going in and changing your grayscale preference for some sort of creative use you have to remember to go back in and change it again right so um, if you use apply image, you don't have to worry about changing your grayscale uh, preferences to match your gray gamma. Um, and anyway, <laughs> there you go. So uh, that's it for my Photoshop rant for this year, uh, the first rant of the year. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Photoshop Rant. You might be interested in more detailed information on my website. And you might consider following me on YouTube and Twitter to find out about my various classes and workshops. Be sure and like the video and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. You might consider following me on Instagram. And I have two books in print available on Amazon in Kindle as well as paper versions, Mastering Exposure in the Zone System for Digital Photographers and my bestseller, Skin, the complete guide to digitally lighting, photographing, and retouching faces and bodies. If you're looking for more in-depth Photoshop tutorials, I have a number of video courses available from my online school under the Education menu at veras.com. And my latest Photoshop course is Complete Hair Masking, where I go into great detail on various old and new school techniques for creating great hair edge composites including how to illustrate hair wisps using special brushes and stock photos of wigs, which I provide for download in the course. Thank you for watching. Post your questions and suggestions for topics to explore under the video, and I'll see you in the next Photoshop rant.